You know, I, I think about where I was and the experience, and I think about where we are now, it's really hard for me to grasp that it's been 20 years. I, I spent the weekend uh, watching video from 9-11, you know, 20 years ago, and every bit of that raw emotion comes back when you watch those grainy photos or videos uh, of that day, and I can vividly remember uh, sitting in my dorm room, you know, having watched uh, some of this, the coverage around the first tower being hit and seeing the second plane come into the second tower and realizing this wasn't some sort of accident. This was a legitimately an attack. The United States was under attack. And that for a person that grew up in the United States in a fairly safe era, post-Cold War, that vulnerability um, hits you like a ton of bricks because you don't think something like that can happen and it, it really changed the way I think a lot of people think about security and safety in this country. I'm curious, what was your sort of 9-11 experience? I know you're slightly younger than yeah. I am. I'm guessing you would have been in was, early high school. I was a junior. Okay. Yeah, yeah, junior in high school. You know, I guess, I mean, a couple of the images or, or thoughts and we'll plug your op-ed. You'll have, depending when you hear this, um, you'll have an op-ed talking about running the Daily Journal and um, various um, channels uh, reflecting on 9-11 and sort of what it means and where we are as we're talking about here. Yeah, I mean, I was a junior in high school. Um, oh, you know, yeah, I mean, maybe even more innocent, I guess, right? My interests were, you know, sports, you know, driver's license, things like that. Um, you know, no, important, I important things, I guess. I understand. School, I suppose. Um, Things that sixteen-year-old yes, males think that, about that you yeah. should think about, um, and yeah, sort of to what you say: is this real? Sort of, you know, what does this mean? It's like I don't, I didn't know. I guess I could have told you who the president was. Probably not a whole lot more. Um, I, I had no real interest in politics at the time or, or following policy. This was sort of what got me interested in it. Um, but you know, one of the things that stands out. Uh, was before 9-11, you know, you saw very f few American flags on houses. I remember afterwards, such the rush, like there was a huge black market for American flags. They were paying $30, $40, $50 um, to have a flag. People had flags on trucks or, or license plates or, you know, obviously on your house. And so that was just sort of a neat thing to say, like, as you like to talk about how we came together, like we never have and certainly 20 years later it feels like we couldn't be further apart as a country right but to, to see that moment um, when we could come together particularly as a 16 year old it's like okay we, we can do this well and and so many of those moments for me revolve around President George W. Bush and it, right. I, I know there are people who don't like him there are people who probably like him on some things and not on others um, I certainly didn't agree with a, on a with him on all public policy, yeah. but but so many of my sort of good memories of him were how he handled yeah. things during 9-11. You know, we've talked about a couple of those stories in the past, but like the Andy Card story, where President Bush is literally reading to a group of elementary kids, and Andy Card has to walk up and whisper in his ear that we've just been attacked. Um, and sort of the resolve of the president to know that he couldn't panic in front of those kids to finish reading that book, no doubt thinking in his mind, you know, this is a big moment, right? Like, I've got to show a kind of leadership um, that maybe I didn't even anticipate having to show. And then you fast forward to that, um, him standing on a rubble pile with his right. arm around a fireman and that bullhorn, um, and that just sort of spontaneous moment, it still gives me chills, yeah. Yeah. Um, where he talks, you know, somebody calls, hollers out, we can't hear you. Yeah. Um, and yeah. he goes on that riff where he says, you know, soon the people that, that brought down yeah. these buildings are going to hear us. Um, that kind of stuff, um, I think, did unite the country. I think for, for a brief moment, people put aside the differences that they had with each other in this country and recognized there was an external threat and there was something worth fighting for and defending in the United States. And I would argue that that now we need, we, we don't need an external threat, right? But we need to recognize as a country that even though there are big differences between the way we think about things, America is an ideal 
that is worth defending and fighting for. Um, and if there's anything we can take away from 9-11, you know, I pray that we never have another incident like that. But our people are capable of banding together. Um, they're capable of showing that kind of camaraderie and compassion and love for one another. And, and I think that's what we need as a country. Yeah, right. And to say that unity didn't mean everyone agreed on everything, right? The, the people who were pro-life did not, you know, or the people who were pro-choice did not all of a sudden agree on that, right? But they agreed, as you talked about, um, what America is, what it needs to be. And I guess that question, uh, you know, was sort of, how do we get there? Is it the fact that things are just so political in a way to where we had that unifying event to where politics were sort of secondary? Now it's almost like politics is just a 24-7 sport, right? I think there's an argument that um, discomfort breeds unity and that in a lot of ways we're too comfortable as a country. Like, if you think about the things that we're fighting over right now, the cultural battles that come up every 24 hours, you know, sure. sort of these cycles of outrage in the news, they're, they're relatively trite things, uh, but they suck up so sure. much energy sure. and they, they carry with them so much intensity. And I think a part of that is like we're just too comfortable um, with what we've got, so we have to start all these like small fights, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I would love to think that we could apply the kind of energy that we see on a day-to-day -day basis in political debate to solving important problems like poverty in America or how do we improve our education system or how do we make sure there's opportunity in this country for the next generation instead of fighting over, you know, the war on Christmas or whatever the, the outrage du jour might be during the, during the day. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know the magic switch to get us there. Right. I, I know that this country is capable of more than what it's currently showing, um, and I think at Empower, you know, we're not trying to change the entire country, but what we are trying to do is to present a vision for a better Mississippi where people don't have to be divided between Democrat and Republican, African American or Caucasian. Um, that doesn't mean we have to agree on everything, but we can agree on the goal, which is a better Mississippi. And I think if people go into that with good faith, there's an opportunity for us to make a real difference.